Um, <clears throat> Dad's lesson this morning was the beginning of a five-part series, okay? He, he noticed the title was 5G, and we only talked about 1G, which means there are four more left. Uh, he asked me before to make that clear because he didn't feel like he made it quite as clear as he could have. And so Dad is beginning a series, and what's interesting about that is that... Um, I've never done this before, but I'm beginning a series. Uh, so uh, it kind of worked out well. It also is a five-part series on being countercultural. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says that we're not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed. And so we're going to look at five different things over the next uh, couple of opportunities I, I'm blessed with to be able to teach. And we're going to look at a couple of different things that Christians should do differently than the world, ways that we should have our actions or our life transformed as opposed to uh, conformed to the way the world does things. So dad's doing a series, I'm doing a series. If you have a fun TV series that you know of, let me know about it because I've been looking for one of those too. So uh, without further ado, let's get into uh, the lesson tonight, which is uh, being countercultural in our speech. Uh, when it comes to speech, you can tell a lot about uh, a person by how they talk. Have you ever noticed that? The way a person chooses to use their words can tell you a lot about who they are. I have, I have three stories, and, and I'm going to try and make them quick, and it's going to belabor the point, but I couldn't cut any of these three stories, okay? Uh, when I moved down here, I was eight years old when my family moved to Texas, and I remember being in Bible class. The first one of the first couple of weeks and a lady named Vanessa Swindell, who some of you may know, uh, was teaching my class and, and she said something and I said, what? And, and she repeated it and I said, I'm sorry, what? And she said it for the third time and finally I said, oh, it's your accent. I can't understand you. At eight years old, I could tell there was something funny about this place. I couldn't understand some people's accents. I could tell there was a difference in the way people talked. Uh, Courtney told me about a time when uh, she was in the second grade, and she uh, got to go to, I think it was New York that she got to go to, and she was flying uh, to New York, and, and she got to sit next to this lucky fella who happened to be from Scotland. And he had a beautiful Scottish accent. And she said for the duration of the flight, all she did was ask him, hey, how do you say this in Scottish? Hey, how do you say garage in Scottish? Hey, how do you say, I bet the guy wanted to jump off the plane. But that's just my guess. All right, Courtney in the second grade could tell there was something different about this guy based on the way he talked. And the last one, the last one, um, <laughs> when I was in... Uh, the third grade, again, right when we moved down here, I was eight years old, uh, we had a, a brother's keepers brown bag luncheon thing. I don't, I was, an eight, I was eight years old. I don't remember what it was. We ate food and we did a Devo. And, uh, and there was a gentleman who led a song at the Devo named Chuck Coffin. And, and he led the song, On a Hill Far Away Stood an Old Rugged Cross. And there was something about the way he led it that just resonated with me, okay? It really hit home. And I was singing it the whole way home, just like he was. On a hill far away, right? Listen, I don't know why, but my parents thought it was hilarious that an eight-year-old Joseph picked up so, so quickly on that accent. And that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is a couple weeks later, there are all of the elders, and Chuck, uh, Chuck was an elder at that time. All the elders and ministers came over to the, our house for a dinner, and my mom said, you guys have to, you have to hear Joseph sing this song and guess who he's singing like. And so I was horribly embarrassed and didn't want to do it, but mom offered a dollar. <laughs> and then a guy named Scott Wolf offered to match that dollar. And so there's no way I was passing up $2. So I climbed underneath the table and sang on a heel far away. And uh, without missing a beat, I think it was his wife said, oh, that's Chuck. All right. So listen, I know I've given too many stories, but the point here is you can tell a lot about the way someone talks. You can tell a lot about a person by the way they talk. Uh, sometimes you can tell where someone's from by the words that they use. If someone addresses a crowd and says, now y'all, now, where are they from? 
somewhere in the South, right? Somewhere in the South, okay? If they say not, listen, youngs, get over, it sounds very strange, but they're probably from the Northeast. My grandparents use that one a lot. Uh, if they say, now you guys, they're from one specific town in Minnesota, right? You can tell even the words people choose to use tells you a little bit about who they are. Uh, and maybe even just the, what they actually say. Uh, have you ever heard someone ask a question and immediately get the response, well, you're not from here, are you? Right, because what you say tells a little bit about who you are. Uh, the point is, you can tell a lot about people by how they talk. So the question, naturally, is what can people tell about you by the way that you talk? What, what can people tell about, about you by the way that you sound, uh, your tone, your, your, the, the way that you uh, use your words? What can people tell about you by the words you actually say? And, and what can people tell about you from the things that you choose to talk about most frequently? I would make the argument that as Christians, all three facets of those uses of speech should show people something about Christ, Right? If we claim to be Christians, then our speech should reflect that. And we should, by our speech and by the way that we talk, show the world a little bit about who Christ is. Uh, look at our, our main verse for this evening is going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. A, a verse I'm sure we're very familiar with, but Ephesians uh, chapter 4 and verse 29. If you remember, this is the section of this letter where Paul is uh, explaining what a new life in Christ looks like. And he rattles off several different examples of what you're supposed to take off from your old life and what you're supposed to put on as a Christian. And so he gets to this one about your speech in verse 29. And he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And so Paul here is saying, from your old life, I want you to take off the corrupting talk, and I want you to put on speech that is building up. And so we're going to kind of break this verse down into those two parts. Uh, the first part of it, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Really, what this is telling us is what not to say. Uh, I, was, I remember I watched a, a show one time, and this guy, he was a salesman, and he had some flashcards. And on all of the flashcards, he had them color-coded. And if it was orange, it was, it was coded, orange, you glad you didn't talk about that, right? And if it was green, it was, go ahead and don't say that, right? He, he said pretty much everything on the card is something not to talk about. But he had these flashcards as a salesman so that he didn't talk about certain things. What not to say cards, right? Paul writes in this passage that there are some things as Christians you don't say. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. And I'm sure, I'm sure that most of you probably knew we were going to go this direction because you don't have a lesson on how a Christian should talk and not address some of the really obvious things that a Christian shouldn't say. Uh, simply, don't curse. Don't gossip. Don't lie. Don't tell inappropriate jokes. I mean, have you ever heard a lesson on a Christian speech and not hit one of those four, if not all of them? I think it's irresponsible not to remind ourselves of the things not to say. So, Paul writes and he says, don't let any unwholesome word, no corrupting talk, come out of your mouth. Uh, sometimes we, we may feel like, um, you know, it's just a, it's just a cultural thing, right? I, I, and there are several justifications that, that I've heard some, I've had conversations with people and heard them try and make for being able to say certain words or, 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 or uh, they rebranded they re lying recently. They call it controlling the narrative, right? We, we do a lot of justifying ways to be able to use unwholesome talk. Uh, you know, um, the bottom line, though, is that this verse says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Uh, the message is pretty clear. Um, in the Greek, the word there for, for corrupting or unwholesome is, is, has the idea of decaying, something that is decaying or rotting, or something that is useless. So when Paul is writing about these words that you're not supposed to use anymore, or these things you're not supposed to say, he's saying don't use rotten and useless words. 
I, I remember there was a movie and I, I never watched the movie, but I saw the commercials for it and I can't vouch for or against it, but it was uh, an Eddie Murphy movie called A Thousand Words. And, and the whole premise of the movie was Eddie Murphy was a, a guy who talked a lot and he had 1,000 words left until he could never talk again. And so there was this tree with 1,000 leaves and every time he said a word, the leaf would fall off the tree, right? That was the premise of the movie. Think about how much more careful you would be if you only had a thousand words left to use. And I mean, that, I imagine that was part of the plot of the movie was learning to be careful with your words. You don't, you don't probably use useless words if you only had a thousand words left. And so um, this idea of, of not letting un, uh, corrupting, decaying or useless words come out of your mouth, uh, Paul wants us to not use those kind of words as Christians. And this is because what we say is uh, important and powerful. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you take this literally for a second, just think back over the last little while, you know, the holidays, the corona days that we've been in for so long, right? What kind of things have come out of your mouth? What kind of things, what kind of words have you been using? Have, have you been using words you shouldn't have been using, and, and if you have, as you're just doing some self-evaluation, what do the things that have come out of your mouth say about the condition of your heart? Uh, you know, that, that's the kind of self-reflection that I think we need to do as we, uh, as we are trying to take off the corrupting talk, like Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, as Christians, there are just words that we shouldn't use. You know, there are just things that we shouldn't say. And like we said before, some people may try and justify it and say, well, that's just, that's just cultural, right? Culture just determines that. And so, you know, Christianity is, is outside of culture. So we have liberty to say whatever we want. And you know what? Whatever. Maybe. You know, maybe if you go to a different, uh, a different country that doesn't identify English curse words as something bad, then you use those certain sounds, and maybe maybe that doesn't mean anything, but you know what? We live here. So if you use curse words in this culture, what does that make people think about you? You think about it this way. Maybe sometimes flipping it around helps. What do you generally think when you hear someone using foul language? Do you immediately associate them with a Christ-centered person? Maybe it's wrong. Maybe people make mistakes and we shouldn't be quick to judge, absolutely. But it doesn't paint their Lord in a great light when you hear someone else use foul language. So if that's the case for us, Christians who shouldn't be judgmental, then imagine what other people think when they hear us use words or tell jokes or gossip or lie of course, they're going to think negatively about us and about the Lord that we serve. We can make an impact for Christ simply by not using certain words, and we can make an impact on other people uh, by having these principles as well. I, I know some of you, well, likely most of you know Willie Franklin. Uh, his son, James, when he was at Missouri, uh, he told me the story one time. He, he went into this, uh, he, he got to play football at the University of Missouri. He was a quarterback. There was even some Heisman talk, you know, one of his, one of his seasons, which was pretty cool. And, uh, and he went into this, uh, this team, this situation, thinking, how can I have an impact on my teammates? And, and to James's credit and to the glory of God, he was able to teach and baptize some of his teammates, which is awesome. And the, one of the ways that he did that was by not letting any corrupting talk come out of his mouth. Uh, James didn't participate in cussing, <laughs> to put it simply, right? Uh, and, and not only did he not participate in it, but he didn't accept it from his teammates. You know, the quarterback is generally the leader of the team, and they can really set the tone for the team. And that was the tone that James chose to set for the rest of his teammates. And he even didn't accept that kind of language from his coach. Uh, he told me a story one time about uh, when his coach was upset with him, they had a bad practice or something, and it's, his coach said, all right, guys, get your blank in that field house, all right? James dropped to a knee, and the rest of the guys just kind of went because they were done with practice. 
The coach said, Franklin, get your blank in that field house. And he said, I can't hear you, coach. And about this time, the coach is getting pretty fired up. It's been a bad practice. He already told him once. He already told him twice. And he said, I can't hear you and dropped to a knee. And the coach storms up to him and says, Franklin, get your blank into that field house right now. And James looks up at him and says, coach, I can't hear you when you talk like that. And so the coach swallowed his pride and said, Franklin, get up in that field house. That made an impact on his team. And James was able to have an impact on several of the players on that team, several of his friends, simply by being countercultural in his speech. Uh, we can make an impact by being countercultural in the words that we choose to use. And like Paul says, not letting corrupting talk come out of our mouths. Similar excuses can be made in, in, in any number of different unwholesome talk when it comes to gossip we can just say, well, we were just trying to keep people informed. When it comes to lying, like we said already, we could just be trying to control the narrative, whatever that was supposed to mean. I don't know how we've just accepted that. But, uh, you know, we can make justifications for all sorts of unwholesome talk. But the bottom line is, he says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. There's just not a whole lot of getting around that. Um, the second part of this verse uh, is, is equally as important, not just what we're taking off, but what we're putting on. Uh, we're to put on uh, good talk. Look, at, Let's read the verse again. It says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So it's not just about uh, what we don't say, but it's also about what we do say. Uh, you know, in the church, the phrase, be a worker in the church, is very common. I mean, have we not all heard a lesson on being a worker in the church? And we, we sing a song about it, I want to be a worker for the Lord. That's a common phrase. And I think a lot of times we kind of do ourselves a, a disservice with that phrase because we, we, we kind of go too hard with it, right? We hear, be a worker, and our mind immediately goes to start a nonprofit and feed orphans. Right? Or we hear, be a worker, and our brain immediately jumps to get on a plane and fly to Africa and teach the gospel, right? And these are great things, and these are part of being workers in the kingdom, right? This is, like Dad mentioned this morning, pure and undefiled religion is caring for orphans, right? Jesus said, go into all the world. Africa counts as all the world, right? These are part of being a worker in the kingdom. But you know what the easiest way to be a worker in the kingdom is? Let only words that are good for building up as fits the occasion that it gives grace to those who hear be the words that come out of your mouth. The easiest way to be a worker in the kingdom is to constantly be building up the body of Christ. There are more verses than we could probably even count in the time that we have that talk about how a Christian is supposed to encourage other Christians, that how, how the church is supposed to build one another up that we're supposed to love each other and encourage one another. The easiest way to, to uh, be a worker in the kingdom is to be someone who is building up. And this is something that our culture is not really up on. Uh, this is not, a, this is not a, a common thing in our culture. Our culture really likes to tear people down. Uh, if someone gets too good at something, well, but they did this and it's bad. Right, if someone is, uh, even if they're trying to, to honor someone, I don't watch, I don't watch these, but you know, Comedy Central does a, uh, they do roasts to honor people. So here's the, here's the premise of a roast, okay? You did such a great job at whatever it is you do. Come sit up here while we say terrible things about you. That's our culture. That's not building up. And that is supposed to honor the person that is there. I, I remember watching a, a clip on YouTube from some some late night show. I don't remember which one, but it's it's all about how celebrities read mean tweets. Basically, they're reading mean things that other people have written about them on the internet. And some of them are really, really creatively mean. I mean, like that is our culture, is to tear down. It's so easy to just tear down. And I don't know why exactly that's the way our culture is, but to be countercultural is to build up. 
If Christians are going to be countercultural in their speech, just like Paul says, we're only going to say things that are good for building up as fits the occasion. And you notice, when you are encouraging to other people, that doesn't take anything away from you. It doesn't cost you any money to, uh, to give someone a compliment. It doesn't take, any, uh, it doesn't take any, any effort to just tell someone that they did a good job with the song leading or that you appreciated their prayer or that uh, you've been praying for them or that you've been missing them. It doesn't take anything from you to be a worker in the kingdom by being encouraging. Um, in, uh, in December of 2017, uh, my wife's grandpa, Waylon Melton, passed away suddenly in a drunk driving accident. Uh, he was pulling out of an elders meeting onto a, a pretty dark road and a, a drunk driver hit a railroad track like a ramp going somewhere between 80 and 100 miles an hour and he died on impact. Uh, we got the call and because of the chaotic nature of his passing, we had to go down there immediately. And so we went down um, and we were with the family and, and we were trying to help with the, the funeral plans and it was, it was a really difficult, I think it was about two and a half or three weeks that Courtney was down there straight, and I was driving back and forth from Houston to Durant uh, over that time period, and it was really, really difficult. When we finally got home, when we finally got home, and Christmas was over, and we were kind of settling, about this time, three years ago, four years ago now, right? Um, or no, three years ago, yeah. We got home and we checked the mail for the first time in like two weeks. And I went in the mail and I had a stack that big that I brought into the house. And you know what they were? They're just letters. We had over 25 people that had taken the time to sit down and write a handwritten letter and send it to our house. That made such an impact on us that I remember it to this day. Courtney has a few of those letters in one of her keepsake boxes didn't take anything away from anyone except for a 10 cent stamp to send a letter and build up a part of the body of Christ who was going through something that was that was difficult as Christians we need to use our speech to be able to build up we need to shake a hand to give a hug I've heard a, a study says that not just children but adults need seven appropriate touches in a day a handshake a pat on the back or a hug that's building up the body of Christ. Uh, we're going to look at a few verses in kind of a rapid fire fashion. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, a verse that was uh, referenced this morning as well. Or Hebrews 10 and verse 24 says, uh, Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Not neglecting the time we have together, but encouraging and building one another up. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14 says similarly, Paul writes, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient uh, with them all. Paul, again, at the end of his letter, giving some instruction, says, encourage the church. Be an encouragement to those you come into contact with. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 40, we're not going to turn over there, but in Acts chapter 16 and verse 40, Paul and uh, Silas have just gotten out of prison. And the first thing they do is go uh, to a house of members of the church and encourage them, right? And that's just one of the times we just got done in our study of the highlights of the lowlights of the book of the Acts of the Apostles of Jesus of Nazareth. Do you remember how many times throughout that study we saw Paul mention how he encouraged the brothers at a certain city? As every time he came into a city, he encouraged the brothers. And every time he left a city, he would encourage the brothers. And every time he passed through a city, he would encourage the brothers. And then when he got done encouraging those brothers, he'd go to another city, give a report, and do what? Encourage the brothers. This is what Paul was doing constantly on his missionary journey. He was building up and encouraging the body of Christ. Even the way he writes his letters, he always makes a point to encourage the church that he's writing to or the individual that he's writing to. So, as Christians, being countercultural in our speech, we are going to take off 
the corrupt, the unwholesome, the, the uh, decaying and useless talk. And we're going to put on words that are encouraging, that give grace to those who hear as fits the occasion. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about tonight is why, why this matters. I know we've already talked a little bit about how some justification can be made for uh, this not being that big of a deal. It's not, they're just words, right? Sometimes we can hear they're just words. They're just, it's just, it's not that big of a deal. Everyone talks like this. It's no problem. So if they are just words, then why does this all matter? Why is this something that's so important that we need to talk about it? Well, we need to be countercultural. So having, saying everyone else is doing it isn't a great answer. But look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, one of my favorite sections of scripture. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse, uh, verse 20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So as Christians, we're given a position. We're ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador? Uh, it's someone who represents a larger group than themselves, right? The ambassador from the U.S. to uh, Russia, he lives in Russia and represents the rest of the United States, which means based on how that person acts, that's what the bulk of... ...constantly lying and taking advantage of people the Russians who come into contact with him are going to believe that Americans as a whole are sketchy and want to take advantage of people. If we're ambassadors for Christ, it's a little more important than Russia. If we're ambassadors for Christ, that means that what people see from us is what they are going to believe about God. So if they see from us corrupting talk and unwholesome words and tearing down of one another, they're going to associate that behavior with who our God is because we're ambassadors for Christ. So it's up to us to show the world that our God is different. If we don't look any different than the world, we're working against the, the job we've been given. See, the ambassador's job is to make the person, that, the country that he's representing look as good as possible and to have a good relationship with other countries. So the ambassador, the Christian ambassador's job is to make God look as appealing as possible, to show who he is, because he is as appealing as it could get. So as ambassadors for Christ, I would say it matters incredibly what words we use. Uh, we're not just ambassadors, but we're ambassadors with a job. We, have a, we don't just have a position, but we have a purpose as well. In verse 18, if you back up just a little bit, it says that all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I know we've talked about this before, but the visual always helps my mind work better. Reconcile, a good word to use for that, is reconnect. When you're a child, you're in a right relationship with God, you don't understand right from wrong fully. Once you get to an age of accountability where you can understand and you make the choice to sin like Adam and Eve made in the garden, you are separated from God, Isaiah 59 tells us. That sin separates us from God. Now we are disconnected from God. And so what Christ did is he came and was able to reconnect us to God by his death on the cross. So then our job is to reconnect other people to God the way that we have had it happen for us. That's our job. That's our, that's our position as ambassadors. And our job as Christians is to reconnect the world to God. This is a pretty heavy responsibility, isn't it? I mean, that's a pretty serious job. It's going to require something substantial to get that done. And the tool that God equipped us with was words. Isn't that kind of neat? He gave us a position, he gave us a job, and he gave us the perfect tool to accomplish the job, which are our words. Look at James chapter 3. 
Look at James 3. Again, a fairly familiar passage about taming the tongue. James chapter 3 uh, in verse 2 says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. So see, James is saying, let me clarify. I'm sure we're all on the same page, but he's not talking about our literal tongue. He's talking about the words that we use. But interestingly enough, your tongue is literally, physically, the most pound-for-pound pound powerful muscle in your whole body. I think that's kind of cool. Pound for pound, your, your tongue is the strongest muscle that you have, which is kind of neat. But he's not talking specifically about our actual tongue. He's talking about the words that we choose to use and how powerful these small, seemingly small words are. So uh, our words are incredibly powerful. They're a, a seemingly small thing that can have a great impact. Just like a small rudder can drive a large ship or a small spark can cause a large forest fire, our words seem like a small thing that can have a great impact. I heard a story about Muhammad Ali. Uh, apparently, he had a teacher growing up that told him that he would never amount to anything. Well, a couple years later, he won an Olympic gold medal and marched right back into that teacher's classroom and set it down on her desk and said, hey, guess what? I'm an Olympic gold medalist. How, why in the world did he feel the need to do that? Because that teacher's words stuck with him. They stuck with him and they were ringing in his ears to make something of himself. So our words are powerful. They can stick with us. They're an incredible tool that, that has been used throughout all of human history. Think, this may seem a little bit silly, but think about it this way. Okay, God used words, he used words to form the entire universe, right? Jesus decided the best tool for him to use wasn't a sword to cut off the uh, servant of the high priest's ear, but words to begin telling everyone about the kingdom. Um, words are at the very core of every revolution in human history, whether it's the uh, you know, the more recent revolutions, the American revolutions, the uprisings from centuries ago, words began these revolutions. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is a powerful document. It's just words, but it's powerful. MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., is not often as remembered for what he did as he is what he said. When you think Martin Luther King Jr., do you think the things he did, which he did some incredible things? No, usually the first thing you think is, I have a dream. The words that he left are what are more powerful than even some of the things that he did when we remember uh, his life. And, and lastly, have you ever noticed what we call the Bible? It's God's word. Listen, my point in mentioning all of this is to say words are incredibly powerful. The tool that God has given us to, to reconcile or reconnect people to himself are words. And they're an incredibly powerful, incredibly volatile, volatile tool that we have. And we're going to make mistakes, and we're sometimes likely going to let some decaying words come from our mouth. And we're going to make some, some mistakes here and there. But the challenge is to attempt as best we can to tame our tongue, to use our words in a way that is not unwholesome, that is not decaying, but is building up everyone that we come into contact with. Jesus, when he was telling us, uh, telling, telling his disciples to go and teach the gospel to every nation, what was he actually saying? He was saying, go use your words and reconnect people to me. This is the tool we've been given and this is why this is such an important lesson for us all to learn, to be countercultural in our speech. 
We've been given a great tool, we've been given a great responsibility, and we've been told not to be conformed to the world and use this tool the way the world sees fit, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and use the tool that God has given us the way he wants us to. Last thing, when I hear that word transformed, don't be conformed, be transformed. The image that comes to my mind first is a car transforming into a person. But the better image for the illustration is a butterfly. Uh, you think about a caterpillar, they're kind of lame, right? I mean, the best thing about a caterpillar is the cameo they had in Lion King when they were slimy yet satisfying, right? Like, like caterpillars, they're just like, you know, squishy little bugs that literally all they do is eat. That's it. They crawl around on leaves and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Butterflies are way cooler, right? They're way cooler. People collect butterflies, in fact. Uh, there's this thing called the migration of the monarch caterpillars. No, it's the migration of the monarch butterflies, and it's majestic and it's amazing. And if it was a bunch of caterpillars, it would be lame. How does a caterpillar become a butterfly? It's transformed. See, a caterpillar doesn't ever become this beautiful, majestic creature with the ability to fly unless it is transformed into the butterfly. We, too, have this potential to be an incredible new creation. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a verse before we mentioned, in verse 17, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We, too, if we allow ourselves to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, we can be a beautiful new creation if we are in Christ. So the question tonight is, are you using your tongue counterculturally? Are you using your words in a way that is building up rather than tearing down? And are you a new creation? Have you been transformed, both continually getting, getting better and better and growing more and more as a Christian, and also, if you're not a Christian, have you been transformed for that first time? Have you gotten into Christ to be that new creation? As is our custom, we offer an invitation. If you have any doubts about the answer to either of those questions, you can come and ask, and we'd be happy to show you what the Bible says about that. And if you have any other needs, like needs of prayers of the congregation, you can also let those be made known now while we stand and sing.